All right, good morning. It is March 27th. This is our week 11 wrap up. So we're going to cover a few topics today. We're gonna to spend some time talking about the cross bridge cycle, what's happening in each of those steps. And then we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, about acetylcholine esterase and acetylcholine. And then we'll take a little bit of time from on activities from the lab packet as well. So kind of an overview of, of our plan for today. So we're gonna start with talking about the cross bridge cycle. When we talk about the cross bridge cycle, we should probably define some words for ourselves here. So um, for my friends who we did talk about this in class together or who had a chance to see this in the office hours video, when I talk about the cross bridge, when we talk about forming a cross bridge, there are two proteins that come together to make a cross bridge. Can you guys tell me the names? What are the proteins that come together to make a cross bridge? Attach to each other to help us do muscle contraction. ATP is my energy source. So ATP is gonna attach to somebody. Yeah, so so we're, we're picking up, uh, ATP likes to attach to the protein called myosin. In my pictures that I, I see up here, myosin is the red protein. Uh, so when I talk about a cross bridge, this is a connection between the myosin protein shown in red, and it's connected, yes, to the thin filament that's made out of actin. Actin is shown in blue. So we have two proteins that are involved in making contraction happen, myosin, being my big red protein, myosin, when, when you're doing your studying and learning about the filaments, myosin is what we call the thick filament. The other protein that I use to form um, the cross bridge is actin, the blue one that I see up here. Um, actin is the thin filament. When you do the process of muscle contraction, we take a muscle cell that's this long and we squeeze it to this long. And that's gonna help your body to do a movement. So we're gonna take a, a cell that's, that's this long, make it shorter. The way that we make it shorter is my blue protein, my actin protein actually slides past my myosin protein. And the way that I can get actin to move past myosin using what, what we're talking about here. So using the cross bridge cycle. Oops, excuse me, cross bridge cycle, okay. So when you're thinking big picture, what's the goal of the cross bridge cycle? Uh, the goal of the cross bridge cycle is to make actin slide past myosin. To make actin slide past myosin. Because this, this movement of actin past myosin ends up making the muscle fiber, remember that's a special name for muscle cells, making muscle fibers shorter. That's how I contract them. So keep in the back of your mind as we talk about each of our steps of the cross bridge cycle, that my goal is ultimately to take a muscle fiber that is this long and squeeze it shorter into a shorter length. That's gonna generate movement for me. That's what the process of movement is when a muscle cell gets shorter. There are four steps to the process of muscle contraction. And when you're looking a few things that, that we want to know with every step. So the first thing that we want to know with every step is whether or not myosin and actin are attached to each other. So over here, I've got step one. Here's step one over here on the left. Step one is called cross bridge formation. I totally just crossed out that word, sorry. <laughs> cross bridge formation. Uh, in cross bridge formation, I am attaching myosin to actin. If we were to put that in the easiest possible words, this is when I attach myosin to actin. So cross bridge formation, definitely myosin and actin are attached to each other because that's the whole goal of this step. When I attach myosin and actin to each other, I then want to slide them past each other because remember that's my goal is to get them to move past each other. So the second step of the cross bridge cycle is what we call the power stroke. And the power stroke is when I actually see actin moving. If you see in the top of this picture, I've got the little arrows. 
those little arrows mean that actin is actually sliding or it's actually moving. So the power stroke is the stage when my myosin protein changes its shape, it bends over, and when it's bending, it's pulling actin along. It's making the, the, the muscle cell shorter. So step one, myosin attaches to actin. Step two, myosin pulls on actin. Step three, as we see right here, this is called cross-bridge detachment. Let's see if I can underline it. There we go. Cross-bridge detachment. And that word detachment means that we're no longer attaching myosin to actin. So in cross-bridge detachment, I no longer have my myosin protein attached to my actin protein. So my myosin protein detaches from or it stops holding on to actin. Now, the reason that I want to do this step where I, I let myosin and actin, they, they let go of each other, is if you notice back up here in, in step two, once I've done the power stroke, once I've taken my myosin protein from standing straight up like it was in step number one to bent over, when myosin bends over like that, it's stuck. Uh, that protein can't go anywhere else. So myosin's bent over here in, in the power stroke stage. At that point, it's kind of worthless to me. Like no more muscle contraction is happening. Myosin and actin are just attached to each other. If my goal was to make things slide past each other, there's no more sliding. So I need to go through and, and detach or make myosin and actin not holding on to each other anymore. That's the goal of this third step here, is for myosin and actin to let go of each other. Now, something that you should um, circle, underline, highlight, star in your notes is the fact that this is when a molecule of ATP attaches to myosin. I know we all can answer this question, so blow up my chat. Help me out here. When I talk about ATP, what's the purpose of ATP in a cell? What does ATP do? for any kind of cell in your body. There we go. Yep, um, lots of us are saying that. It's all about energy, right? ATP, that's my energy source. So I am attaching my ATP molecule, the thing that stores energy for my cell. I'm attaching that to myosin in this stage. Now, a note that we should maybe make for ourselves about this third step here. We attach, ATP, oops, would help if I could spell, attach ATP to myosin in this stage, but we do not, do not use the energy that's stored in ATP in this particular stage. Stage three, all I do is I attach myosin to ATP to myosin, but it's still, since it's still ATP right here, ATP has a bunch of energy. The goal attaching ATP to myosin is to change its shape. I, I put something uh, inside a special pocket on myosin, and when I put it in that pocket, myosin changes its shape. That shape chain make, change makes it let go of actin. So to get myosin and actin to stop being attached to each other, which is what's going on at the end of the power stroke. What I do is I say, hey, myosin, I've got this energy rich molecule. Would you rather hold this? And myosin drops its hold on actin and now it's holding ATP. Myosin and actin are not attached to each other anymore. But just because myosin and actin are not attached to each other, doesn't mean that myosin could attach to actin again. If I want myosin to be able to attach to actin again, which I need it to be able to do if I keep sliding these proteins past each other, to get it attached to myosin again, I've got to do step number four. Step number four is called a cocking of the myosin head, or sometimes you hear it called reactivation of the myosin head. The goal of this last stage is to use the energy of ATP, that's what this little word right here means, using the energy that's stored in ATP to take my myosin molecule that used to be bent over, so in the previous picture, it was bent over kind of like this, to take it from a bent over shape like we see there to this standing upright shape. 
because if myosin is going to be able to attach to actin again, it's going to have to be standing straight up. It's going to have to be in what we call the cocked position, the ready to attach to, to actin stage. So let's review quickly here what happened in each of our stages of the crossbridge cycle. Stage number one, over here on the left, where we started, called cross bridge formation. In the simplest possible way, this is when I form the cross bridge. And the cross bridge is when myosin and actin attach to each other. That's pretty basic. Uh, maybe a note to make for yourself is, is for this to be able to happen, for myosin to be able to attach to actin, it needed to be in the cocked position. The cocked position. Or like we could see from our, from our picture, standing straight up. It needs to be standing straight up. So for cross bridge formation to happen, myosin needed to be standing straight up. If myosin is standing straight up and actin has a spot for myosin to attach to it, we will do cross bridge formation. Myosin uh, is attached to actin. We then uh, are going to do the next stage called the power stroke. The power stroke, big picture, what happens here is actin moves. That's why we circled our little arrows here. So actin actually slides past myosin. The reason that actin slides is because my myosin protein went from standing straight up, like we saw in the cross bridge formation step, to bent over, like we see in this picture here. The way that myosin goes from standing straight up to bent over is what you can see right here on the side of this picture. Myosin spits out uh, the ADP molecule and this inorganic phosphate molecule. Here is a reminder, we talked about this, um, I think it was in Tuesday's discussion, at the end of Tuesday's office hours. If you missed that, go back to the recording for it. ATP, you guys told me, um, has a lot of energy. We've got a lot of energy in ATP. When I chop up ATP to get its energy out, I make ADP. ADP doesn't have energy. There's no energy there. So when myosin is attached to ADP, like I see over here in step one, there's no energy left in that molecule. There's not a good reason for ADP to stay attached to myosin. And in fact, when it's time for myosin to change its shape and to bend over so that it can pull on actin, it's actually going to let go of that low energy molecule. It's going to drop that to allow it to bend over, to allow it to pull on actin. So step one, myosin attaches to actin. Step two, myosin pulls on actin. That makes it move. Step three, because myosin is stuck attached to actin and it has no energy and it's the wrong shape, it's going to let go of actin when I attach an energy rich molecule to it. Again, the best analogy I can give you is you've got a kid who's playing with something they're not supposed to. So it's what mom's cell phone, right? Or the car keys. And you say, hey, why don't you take this uh, for my daughter, it's either cheese cubes or it's it's a cookie. I say, hey, why don't I use some cheese cubes and you give me back the, the keys that I need? Um, whatever the case may be, we give myosin ATP. When I give it this energy-rich molecule, it lets go of actin. No more. Yeah, it's basically an exchange. Yes. Yeah, I like, I like that terminology. An exchange from you were holding actin, now I want you to hold ATP. So it lets go of actin. Now it's holding on to ATP. When uh, the, the final stage then in the cross bridge cycle is myosin realizes, oh, ATP's got energy in it. If I chop up that ATP to get that energy out of it, I can stand straight up. And if I'm standing straight up, I can attach to actin again and we can do this whole process over again. So the four stages of the cross bridge cycle. Like we said at the beginning, the goal of the cross bridge cycle is to help me slide actin past myosin to help me do muscle contraction. To do that, I've got to use myosin, I've got to use actin, I've got to use ATP, my energy molecule, to make it happen. All right, help me out. 
I want to know, yep, and then the circle starts all over again. Absolutely. Once I get to this stage down here, number four, uh, once myosin is backed in the cox position and it's standing straight up, as long as there's a place for it to be able to attach to actin, absolutely it is going to. Um, let me check out, I saw a question pop up there. What tells ATP to attach to the head? Um, there's not that there's something in particular that tells ATP to attach to the head. If I have ATP available and it's floating around, it basically just will. It, it, it's kind of, uh, we talked about, remember way in unit one, we talked about passive transport, where things go from high concentration to low concentration. So I've got a bunch of ATP molecules that are floating around. If they're floating around by a myosin protein, and the myosin protein, so let me get my pointer back here, uh, the myosin protein isn't attached to anything. At the end of the power stroke, myosin is all by itself. It's just attached to actin, there's no way. If an ATP molecule happens to be floating around, and it, it sees that there's an opening for it, there's a space for it, it will just attach. So it's not that there's something in particular that tells it to happen. It just happens to be bouncing around inside your muscle cell and says, oh, look, there's a space for me to attach here. And it does. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna, gonna farm this vote or farm this question out to the class. Uh, one of us asked about rigor mortis. Uh, rigor mortis does relate to the cross bridge cycle. And, and we've got some, some videos that explain how rigor mortis attaches or uh, relates to the cross bridge cycle. Um, here is my question that I wanna see if any of us here in the class can, can help out with. Rigor mortis is when your body gets stiff after you die. Um, yeah, so rigor, are, we're, we're stiff because we've died. When we die, what does our body stop making? When you're dead, I can no longer make, yeah, Rose is chiming in with ATP. Multiple of us were saying we can't make ATP. Absolutely. Okay, so rigor mortis. First thing for us to know about rigor mortis, rigor mortis literally means stiffness from death. So it's after death. And once I die, as you guys are all telling me, death equals no ATP, no ATP. ATP is involved in which of my four stages here? Which is the one where I see ATP? What number? You don't have to give me the name. What number do you see ATP in? Yeah, we're starting to see three. Yep, three, 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 detachment. It's all about detachment. I don't have ATP. The step that I can't do in the cross bridge cycle, I can't do step number three which means that I get stuck. Oh, let me get my point back, sorry. I can't do step number three because I don't have the ATP I need for it. That means that I am stuck at the end of stage two. Help me out here in, in brief, as brief as you can, what's happening or what's going on at the end of stage two? When I finish the power stroke, can anyone tell me what's happening in my muscle cell after the power stroke's done before ATP comes in? Does anyone remember? Let's see if we can remember. Okay, so we're close, Kelly. Kelly said contraction. Um, we, we just contracted, we just slid past each other. Um, my protein, my my protein changed shape, yep. And it, it changed shape to this bent over position. Uh, let me ask my question another way. When it's in this bent over position, myosin is or is not attached to actin? It is or is not attached to actin at the end of stage two? What do we think? Yeah, lots of us are chiming in. At the end of stage two, after I've spit out my, my low energy molecules, I don't need them anymore, that allows me to better. I moved actin, but once I'm done doing that, I'm stuck, attached to actin. 
So at the end of stage two, what happens is uh, myosin is bent over and it's stuck, attached, actin. At the end of stage two, myosin is attached, it's bent over, there's no more movement that's going to happen because myosin has no energy. So if I don't have ATP, because the goal, uh, maybe, maybe a note for us to, to make for ourselves, the reason in st stage three that I attach ATP to myosin, the only goal of step three is to make myosin and actin stop attaching to each other. That's the only goal of ATP right here, is just to do detachment, just to make them stop attaching to each other. So I have rigor mortis, when I've died and I'm not making ATP anymore, I get stuck in the stage where myosin is bent over and it's attached to actin. When I have those two stuck to each other and they're attached, I'm going to get stiff because myosin and actin can't move past each other anymore. They're stuck. So basically I got us there with, uh, with rigor mortis. Do we have any other specific questions about rigor mortis? Or if we feel good on rigor mortis in the cross bridge cycle, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. Give me that thumbs up emoji. That's, that's over there, if you feel good about it. And again, feel free to type me a question. I'll give us some time. I know typing takes some time. So let me give us a little bit of time here. Nicole is asking about the protein that changes shape when calcium attaches to it. Um, that's a good question here about to switch slides. If you have not already writ written this information down, go ahead and take a quick picture on your phone because once I go away from this slide, it's never coming back. It's gonna eat all my words for me. So take a pic pic quick picture of this slide because I'm gonna talk about our, our other proteins here. All right, let's, I think it's this way. Yes, okay. We have four proteins that are involved in muscle contraction. Two of those proteins are directly involved in muscle contraction. So the first protein that's directly involved in muscle contraction that we just talked about is muscle. Myosin is the one that ATP can attach to. Myosin is the one that attaches to my other protein that does contraction called actin. So. Myosin and actin are the two proteins. We call them contractile proteins. They do contraction. And then we've got two other proteins here involved in this process, tropomyosin and troponin. The way that I like to describe these two proteins, uh, the first one, tropomyosin, I like to describe that one as the wet spaghetti noodle. The job of tropomyosin is to cover up the myosin binding sites that I see on actin. If I didn't have tropomyosin, myosin could always attach to actin and we would get rigor mortis a whole lot faster. So the, the job of tropomyosin is to cover up the myosin binding sites. And what I like about that is its name actually has myosin in it. So it helps us to know that's its job. What I like to say that troponin is, is troponin is a pushpin. This pushpin protein helps to hold tropomyosin in place because tropomyosin is a wet spaghetti noodle. And if you've ever played with spaghetti, you try to hold it out straight and it's gonna sag in the middle. If I want it to hold out straight, I'm gonna to have to put a little push pin in the middle. The job of troponin is to be a push pin, to keep tropomyosin in place. When we wanna do muscle contraction, our muscle cell spits out calcium. Uh, let, me, let me refer to my chat here, help me out. When calcium gets spit out, is it tropomyosin or troponin that um, that calcium is going to attach to? Where is that calcium going to attach to directly? Troponin or tropomyosin? What do we think?
yeah, a couple of us are starting to remember. Um, the, the protein that, that calcium directly attaches to is troponin, my pushpin protein. So when calcium attaches to my pushpin protein, instead of being pushed into that bulletin board, it's popped out. And when I take out that push pin, now my spaghetti noodles all saggy in the middle, which means that I am going to be able to attach my myosin to those binding sites. So troponin is what directly it interacts with calcium, but tropomyosin is what, what ends up moving. Both troponin and tropomyosin move, but it's the movement of tropomyosin that ends up allowing me to do muscle contraction. By the way, the word we used for troponin and tropomyosin, we called those guys regulatory proteins. Regulatory proteins, meaning that they regulate muscle contraction, but they don't directly do muscle contraction. Myosin and actin are my contractile proteins that actually do contraction, contractile proteins. Troponin and tropomyosin are my regulatory proteins. They decide whether or not we're actually contracting. And the way we actually contract is what we started with talking about, uh, the cross bridge. All right, let me give you a moment for any last minute questions about this. Okay, we have a question about the protein that's attached to the Z-disc. So that is uh, referring to our sarcomere structure. So we might need to pull up our lab packet um, or we've got our, let me see if I can find, here we go. Here is my, my picture of a sarcomere here. Um, so let me put some numbers on, on my sarcomere image here and then we will um, we'll work together to figure out what some of these numbers represent. So here we go, number one, oops, number one, number one, no, uh, whatever. <laughs> it's Friday, right? My technology is done. Uh, number two, we're going to call this blue thing. I'll put right on top of it. Number three, we're going to call the red one. Number four, um, those, okay. Um, so the question from the homework was asking us about the Z-discs. When I look at the sarcomere, which of those numbers that I labeled is the Z-disc? Which number shows me the Z-disc of the sarcomere here? Yeah, we're all chiming in. Uh, the Z-disc on my sarcomere is, is number one out here. So here's my Z-disc with that zigzag pattern over here. Okay, so we got the Z-disc. Um, when I ask you about what's attached to the Z-disc, which number of my proteins do, do we see that is directly attached? Which one did I number that's attached? Yeah, we're chiming in with number three. Protein number three is the one that's directly attached to the Z-disc. And the name of protein number three, what would, would this protein be called? That blue one or the thin filament? Yep, the actin protein. My actin proteins are directly attached to the Z-discs on the outside. What this means for you, by the way, when I do muscle contraction, is remember that actin is the protein that actually slides past myosin. Well, actin is attached to those two edges of the sarcomere. We said that during muscle contraction, the sarcomere gets smaller. This is why the sarcomere gets smaller because the actin proteins are directly attached to this Z-disc here on the outside. So number one, representing my Z-disc over here. Number three, representing actin. What's the name of my protein here, number four? Who's number four? <coughs> what protein is this big one here? Yep, there we go, we're getting it. This big one right here, shown in red, that's my myosin protein. So the myosin protein is attached to my structure right here in the middle, the structure number two. It's a line of proteins in the middle of my sarcomere. The name of this is the, what's number two called? Yeah, there we go. We're gonna send it. It's, it's the line in the middle, also known as the M line. So uh, sarcomere structures, 
Again, that's some overlap with lab. So when you're when you're going through and answering those questions, if you feel like there wasn't enough information in your lecture packet about it, feel free to reference the lab packet too, because they're covering the same kind of information. You're welcome. Yes, happy to uh, to address that with you. All right. Any other questions that we have about that? Before I move on to, we want to talk about acetylcholine esterase again. So I'm going to find that slide for us. Any last minute questions about that? All right, well, if you think of any, please still put them into the chat. If I don't address them before I dive into other stuff, um, I can come back to them toward the end. Let's pull up acetylcholine esterase again. Acetylcholine esterase is, is a topic that we covered in the second half of our lesson. Um, so acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme. So um, acetylcholine esterase equals an enzyme. Remember back from unit two that uh, when we talk about enzymes, that's a protein that can do something for me. And a lot of times the name of a protein gives me a really good idea of what it's doing. So the first part of the name of this protein is acetylcholine. That tells me that the thing that this protein breaks down or that it works on is acetylcholine. The job of acetylcholine esterase is to break down acetylcholine, to break down acetylcholine. That's in, in easy words, that's what this enzyme does. When you look at our picture here, they didn't make acetylcholine esterase look pretty or anything, but here it is down here. So acetylcholine esterase is a protein that I find uh, in any place where I have what's called a synapse. So a synapse is um, a place where two cells meet. A synapse is a place where two cells meet. If those cells are communicating with each other using uh, acetylcholine, which is the case when we're talking about neurons talking to muscle cells, if we use acetylcholine as my message that I send from one cell to another, I'm also going to use acetylcholine esterase or have that present. Because see, here's what happens um, in the process of muscle contraction. We'll start up here at the top. Hey, let's make a lab correlation here. Let's see if we can do this. I'm looking at a neuron up here. This neuron is talking to a muscle cell. Yesterday during our office hours, we talked about how there are three different kinds of neurons. We have what's called a sensory neuron. We have what's called a motor neuron, and we have what's called an interneuron. This particular neuron is talking to a muscle cell. Which of those uh, functional classifications of neurons talk to muscle cells? Does anyone remember? We had sensory, we had motor, and we had interneurons. We're trying to remember which kind talks to muscle cells. Yes, several of us are chiming in here. The kind of, of neuron, no, you're good. Hey, it, there's no shame in, in putting the wrong answer out there. So um, this kind of neuron that I'm looking at right here in my picture, this is a motor neuron. I know that because it is talking to a muscle cell. So this neuron is talking to a muscle cell the way that it talks to the muscle cell is using this little chemical, this little neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is the message that a, a neuron releases. It spits that message out into the space. Now, when we talked about this on, I think it was on Wednesday, um, we, we said that this particular synapse, this particular place where two things meet, we have a special name for it because we have a neuron that's talking to a muscle cell. 
this particular synapse is what I call the neuromuscular junction. Ooh, we can't see that all. Neuromuscular junction right there. That's a word from the lab packet. It just means for us as a place where the neuron meets a muscle cell. So step one in this process of getting a muscle to contract is a neuron spits out the acetylcholine message. That message gets spit out into the muscular junction where these things meet. And that neurotransmitter goes down and it attaches to um, my, my types of channels. Here's an underlying highlight star for us. We, we must know this right here. They are chemically gated sodium channels chemically gated sodium channels. We must know that that is what acetylcholine attaches to. And there are multiple places in your, in your notes packet that says that, but please make sure we know we are using a chemical called acetylcholine to open up a channel on my muscle cell. Since my chemical is a key, this is a chemically gated channel. Once I've received that message, once my, my muscle cell here depolarizes its membrane or it starts to go positive because I open the channel, then I'm done with acetylcholine. I don't need to listen to that message anymore. I'm done with it. So this message, acetylcholine, detaches from the chemically gated channel and it starts floating around here in the neuromuscular junction. When it's floating around here in the neuromuscular junction, it's going to bump into acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase, remember we said, is the enzyme that its job is to break down acetylcholine. So what happens when acetylcholine bumps into this enzyme, this protein, this protein goes all karate on it and chops it up. We go from having a, a circle acetylcholine to we chop it in half and we've got choline and we've got acetate. I've chopped acetylcholine into two pieces. The reason I want to chop it into two pieces is now if these two pieces float around in the neuromuscular junction, they can't go find another chemically gated channel to open up. Once I chop them into two pieces, that message is done. Essentially, the job of acetylcholine esterase is to make sure we only hear messages one time. We don't want to keep hearing them forever and ever and ever. So I use acetylcholine esterase to chop them up. I hear them when a neuron first spits them out, and then I don't hear them any longer. That's the job of this acetylcholine esterase enzyme. So help me out. What questions do we have um, either about acetylcholine esterase or about kind of this signaling process right here? that we're talking about. What questions do we still have about this? Or if we feel good, give me a thumbs up. Um, the steps one through four, they are different in your packet, uh, but they are present in the lesson. When I was building the online lesson, I wanted to uh, I wanted to make sure that we had a little bit better of a description of the picture. So you can find this embedded in lesson number nine. Um, you can take a picture of it right now, or you can flip back to lesson number nine. You do have these words; they're just not in your packet because I, I made it a little bit more um, a little bit more specific or easier to to flow on that lesson for you. So good question, Nicole. Um, you you do have access to these words; they're just not. Um, in your, your notes packet because I did add this clarifying information. Um, Bella asks, acetylcholine is bad if it never breaks down. Um, let me put that question to the class. And we talked about this a little bit um, on Wednesday, I think. What did we say might happen if acetylcholine is never broken down? Do we have some ideas? What might happen in your body if I never break down acetylcholine. Yeah, so Letty's putting out, out the option of something like muscle spasms or deep dimension for us. Yeah, constant muscle contraction. Um, I would say yes. The answer to your question, um, is acetylcholine bad if it never breaks down? I would say yes. Um, 
because the job of acetylcholine is to tell a muscle cell to contract, but you don't want to tell a muscle cell to contract longer than it's supposed to. If I have a muscle that just keeps contracting and keeps contracting and it, it never stops contracting, that's very painful. Um, speaking from pregnant lady uh, experience here with muscle cramps in the night, it's so terrible. So um, yes, muscle cramps, muscle spasms. If we can't get rid of the acetylcholine, it's, it's I keep thinking that our muscle is getting the message it's supposed to contract when it's, it's not supposed to. Yeah, so Nicole is hinting at us that we might want to um, relate this discussion to sarin gas. That's my wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm going to be the mean teacher and uh, go into sarin gas because I really want you to try to think this out and hash it out together. Uh, but yes, sarin gas does have to do with, with the question that we asked about if acetylcholine's bad, if it never breaks down. So as you're reading about sarin gas, consider the way that sarin gas works and how it messes up this process that we were talking about here. Yes, that was awful to see and read. Absolutely, I, I totally agree. Um, there is a reason that sarin, um, it, using it is considered a crime against humanity. It, it's absolutely terrible. So um, the good news is we get to understand how it works on a chemical level and that helps us to understand why it does these terrible things to the body. So. Um, yeah, that's as far as I'm going to take you with sarin gas, but this picture should be really helpful as you're, you're sorting out um, what sarin gas does. And I did mention this in, um, in the Wednesday session. The two things that, um, the two conditions that we're, we're learning about to help us understand muscle contraction, two, two scenarios when it goes wrong, are sarin gas and Botox. At the end of the day, when you are studying sarin gas and Botox, basically I want you to get it down to the point that we see on this slide here. We want to know, is sarin a problem with too much or too little acetylcholine? And don't, don't put it in the chat because um, I want to make you think about it. Um, when we're talking about sarin or when we're talking about Botox, big picture, big idea what I want you to know, do I have too much acetylcholine that, that's chilling out in my body or do I have too little acetylcholine? What's going on? with this, this signaling stuff. So big picture, what you're boiling down sarin and Botox to is as simple as this, too much or too little. All right, I'm looking at my list over here. We said we wanted to do cross bridge cycle. We got cross bridge cycle. We said we wanted to do acetylcholine esterase. We said we wanted to do rigor mortis. Um, those were our lecture topics that we said we wanted to talk about. Are there any other lecture topics before we switch to lab stuff? Um, so Pilar is asking about Botox. Um, here's what I'll do. Um, I'm not going to give you the answer to the question, Pilar, but let me pull up our picture of Botox. When we talk about Botox, I'm going to, I'm going to put my neighbors on, on the spot here. Somebody help me out. When we do Botox, when we insert botulinum toxins into our face, um, what is, what, do, what does Botox actually do? If you were to describe it as easy as possible, what would we say that, that the Botox, the botulinum toxins, what do they do in the body? Can anyone put it in easy words for me? Any ideas? Okay, it does stop muscle contraction. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, Pauline's chiming in for us. The, the way that it blocks the muscle contractions actually has nothing to do with the receptors for acetylcholine. It has everything to do with the way that I release my acetylcholine. So let me go one slide more specific here. I'm looking inside a neuron. So over here on the left, I'm looking at when all things are normal, inside my motor neuron, I have some acetylcholine here. That acetylcholine until the neuron decides that it needs to talk to the muscle fiber to tell it to contract. 
when it decides it needs to talk to the muscle fiber to tell it to contract, it's going to spit out all those little acetyl acetylcholine uh, molecules that will go down and open up those receptors. So normal situation, we take our stored acetylcholine and we spit it out into the neuromuscular junction to allow the muscle cell to contract. When I have botulinum toxin, when I put Botox into my face, um, what ends up happening is the little toxin right here, I can, the little toxin enters the, the cell. So when that toxin gets into the cell, it kind of acts like a pair of scissors. So it goes in and it starts to, to, to chop up a couple of types of proteins. So the first type of proteins, let me get my marker. The first type of proteins that it's chopping up are these ones over here. These proteins over here that, that it chopped up, if you look at my picture um, of, an, of what happens normally, these proteins that are here in, in the membrane of a neuron, their job is to kind of serve like a docking station. It's a place for these little bubbles filled with acetylcholine to attach to. So the first thing that Botox does, it goes through and it chops up my dock where, where this is supposed to attach to. But the second thing that, that the Botox toxin does over here, we can see it, is it chops up the little blue protein that was attached to my bubble with acetylcholine. That protein is what you see hanging down over here on my left image. That little blue protein right there is what I use to attach to my dock protein. So I, I need to have a string that I could toss out to the person standing on the dock for them to pull my boat in to the dock. But I also need to have a dock for me to attach to. So botulinum toxin goes through and it chops up my, my dock where my boat was going to go. And it also chops up that rope that I was going to use to, to toss to a person to help me to get there. If I do those things, I cannot get this acetylcholine into the, the neuromuscular junction. So like Pauline mentioned for us, and a couple of us mentioned too, what happens with Botox is I just can't spit out acetylcholine. I've got acetylcholine inside my neuron. It's waiting to release it, except I don't have a way for me to get to the membrane so that I can release it. So with, with Botox, um, it actually has nothing to do with my receptors down here. Those receptors down here aren't involved at all. They're waiting for acetylcholine. Uh, it never comes because we chopped up the way that I'd spit out that acetylcholine. Yeah, so Pilar, your last, com your last comment that it does not allow the release. Absolutely correct. Botox prevents the, the release. I gotta go back for my friends who haven't been able to uh, attend other office hours. Right here. I would like you guys to know that I made this meme personally. Um, so Botox, botulinum toxin, is literally the most toxic thing known to man. Um, it's very tightly regulated. I think I've told you guys a few times that I worked for a dermatologist. She did skin cancer and she did cosmetics. So we did Botox um, a couple of days a week. And the thing with Botox is because it's so toxic, we had to keep a very good log of of how many units we put into what patients and we were constantly checking our supply to make sure we had what we needed. So um, making sure none of our Botox runs off on us. So um, yeah, we're, we're living a little dangerously when we put this, this toxin into our face. Um, but hey, those wrinkles, they go away for a while. Like you mentioned PLR, yes, it's not forever. Um, it's not forever because I can start making new proteins inside my neuron, that's what I do. I make new proteins in my neuron and as I make new proteins in my neuron, um, I'm able to start spitting out acetylcholine again. So it is not permanent. It, you do have to go back and um, get it again repeatedly if you if you start to love again. <laughs> All right, final call on lecture questions. And if you feel like I didn't hit your question really well, reference back to Tuesday and Wednesday's recordings. So the dates on that would be the 24th and the 25th. We spent those two days really talking about, about lecture stuff. Um, could we do action potential? 
how about how about this Lexi what I will do is I'm gonna put that on my list if we have a little bit of time at the end I will come back to that um, because I did talk about that on um, that was probably on Tuesday so if I have time, I will come back to action potential because um, I want to make sure we have some time to do the joints and I'll talk through that origin and insertion activity one more time um, so I've got that on my list, Lexi. I'm not ignoring it. We will come back to it at the end. Let me bounce to joints. This won't take us long. So let me bounce to joints. We'll take a little bit longer on um, that origin insertion activity, but I should have time to talk about action potential. We'll go back to that. Let's pull up. So now we're bumping to the lab packet. Um, here's what I will say for you guys with um, with the lab packet. For those of you that haven't been to office hours before, um, the student Google Drive has the correct week numbers on the packet. So when you go into the student Google Drive right now, week 11 says nervous tissue um, and bones and muscles of the lower limb. When you open that up, it still says week 10 on it because it's a PDF. Um, don't freak out about that as long as you're going with what has the right label in the student Google Drive you're looking at the right stuff so this week is a nervous issue next week is when we start the brain um, so that week 12 is when we start the brain we'll do some more with the brain the week after that and then we'll do the spinal cord um, in case you hadn't heard or seen we are no longer doing the special senses lab this semester we had that extra week of spring break. So special senses lab is cut completely. It's not in a student Google Drive anymore. If you printed it, it would be a good reference for, um, for lecture, but it's not required. I'm gonna give you what you need for lecture. So just a heads up, um, what we are focusing on with today's, um, today's lab stuff and this week's lab stuff is the lower limb, specifically when we're talking about joints. So the leg, essentially. The advice that I, I have for you guys as it relates to the joints, um, there are parts of this lab packet that you have to memorize, meaning there's no other way to know that information except committing it to your memory, making your flashcards, quizzing yourself, that kind of stuff. That's things like bone markings. Um, that's things like muscles that live on the front side of my thigh are used to flex the femur or muscles that live on the back side of the thigh. They're used to extend the femur. Those kind of things you have to memorize. There are not a lot of things here in the joints that you have to memorize. Uh, because a lot of, as you'll see as we go through them, the name of the joint comes from the bones or the bone markings that are found there. So um, I have listed for you kind of in short chunks some of the joints that we need to know from the leg this week. Um, if I look at the names of these joints, let's start with the one here in the middle. The interphalangeal joint. Hey, we know that word phalangeal sounds like phalanges. What's the easy person word for phalanges? The phalanges are your, yeah, some of us are fingers. Yep. And if I had my daughter in here, maybe someday, like at the end of class, I'll bring my daughter in just to say hi. She does know that these are her phalanges, her fingers. So um, when I look at the name of this joint called the interphalangeal joint, the place that I find the interphalangeal joint is between the phalanges. That's literally what its name means. Inter means in between. So the interphalangeal joint found in between the phalanges. Perfect. The name of the joint tells me exactly where it is. Hey, this one right here is called the sacroiliac joint. The sacro part of its name tells me one of the bones that it's by. Same thing with this iliac word. So the sacro part of its name we means which bone? Sacro is going to refer to, yep, Pauline's chiming in, a couple of us chiming in. Sacro refers to sacrum, okay? And iliac refers to the iliac or the ilium bone. They mean they're the same thing. Ilium. So, okay. The sacroiliac joint is the joint between the sacrum 
and the ilium or the iliac bone. The one on my list um, uh, right here that we see that we are just to memorize is the coxal joint. But hey, way back in week one, or week two, excuse me, way back in week two, we learned the coxal region being the hip region. Here it is back to haunt us. That coxal means the hip. So at the hip, we have our femur bone, and then we have this indentation and in all the bones that live in the, the pelvis, this indentation called the acetabulum. So the coxal joint is one that we do have to memorize. Its name doesn't tell us. But interphalangeal, sacroiliac, that, those names tell us. Hey, we move on to the next page, and we've got the femoropatellar joint. Both of those are bone names. Tarso metatarsal. Again, we got the tarsals and the metatarsals. Tibio femoral. Here's the big thing, big idea here with joints. If its name looks like bones, those are the bones that it's in between. And you guys don't have to spell these joint names. We just need to have an idea of where we'd find them. So make sure you can interpret their names to get an idea of where they are in the body. There's a couple of kinds of questions we could ask you about these joints on, uh, on the exam. The first kind of question that, that we could ask you, and here I'll, I'll write this down for us. Um, first kind of question that we could ask you is we could, um, um, let's see, identify joint in picture. What I mean by that is I could have a skeleton and I can have a marking on all of the joints of the leg and ask you which letter represents the uh, tibiofemoral joint. And you would tell me what letter is the tibiofemoral joint. So the first kind of question that I could ask you is I can give you a picture of a skeleton and ask you, where do I find this particular joint? Second way that I can ask you about uh, joints is I can ask you, um, which bones are found? Which bones are found at the joint? That's gonna come directly from, from their names. So which bones are found at the joint? Um, oh, I apologize, it says arm, it's supposed to say leg. This is, this is in your lab packet. This is in between bones and muscles in your lab packet. It's also in the lesson. Yeah, I apologize, um, that's a typo. This is what happens when your teacher makes like a million PowerPoints. <sighs> These are, these are also found in, in the leg. Here's how we know these are from the leg, by the way. Tibio fibular. Oh gosh, I hope my tibio fibular joint is not in my arm, right? I really hope that's not where it is. That would, that would be real bad. So <laughs> yes, I apologize. I, I, this is what happens when I copy and paste. So this is joints of the leg. Okay, so with any of the joints, whether it's the leg this time, whether next week we're talking about joints in the back, um, in the arm. First way I can ask you is to identify it in a picture. So kind of like I, I, I label 20 joints and ask you which one is the one you're looking for. Yes, thank you, Pilar. Page nine. Um, second thing I can ask you is which bones are found in a joint. The third way I could ask this question um, is I could give you a description and ask you to, to give me the name. So match description of joint with name. However, I am not going to ask you to spell the name of the joint. What I would probably do is give you a list of all the joint names and, and then give you this, the description like you say here. When I'm talking about the joint between the tibia and the fibula at the knee, it would be considered. Or when I'm talking about the joint between the metatarsals and the phalanges, which joint am I talking about? So three kinds of questions that we could ask you with these joints and this is over the course of of all the joints we talk about this semester make sure you can find it on a skeleton make sure you know what joint what bones are found there and make sure you could describe where that joint is found basically that's the kinds of questions that we asked or will ask excuse me any questions about that aspect of this activity Let me show you the other thing we're doing with joints this week. The other thing we're doing at joints this week is we are identifying which of those bone markings that you're learning belong to each of these joints. 
in general, here's kind of a heads up for you. Um, bone markings have two purposes. First purpose, number one, is uh, to form joints. So that's what this activity is doing for us. And number two is for muscle attachment. So we're using our bone markings to do both of these things, to talk about the joints that they're a part of or to talk about the muscles that attach. So these lists right here, in a, the, the last part of page nine in your lab packet asks you to list some of the bone markings that are found near the hip, that are found near the knee, that are found near the ankle. Um, here's what I'll tell you about this particular activity. Honestly, you may not need to actually write your answers to this activity. This would be an activity to, for you to pull up a picture of the hip joint that's not labeled and see if you can quiz yourself and see how many bone markings you can identify there. Or again, pull up a picture of the knee joint. See how many bone markings you can label there. Or uh, I, I did mesh, mention for you um, in the announcement I posted yesterday, if you are very much a hands-on learner and you really prefer to kind of touch and feel and play with skeletons, I found a couple that aren't super expensive on Amazon that I posted a link for you. Um, you'd be welcome to 20 or 25 bucks for that skeleton. Um, if you want to get one of those, then you can hold your skeleton up in front of you and say, okay, here's the knee. I want to know what bone markings I see on the tibia that make up the knee. I want to know what bone markings I see on the femur that make up the knee. I want to know the bone marking. Well, there's not really any markings. Uh, I can ask you this question, though. What's the name of the kneecap bone? What's that bone on the very front of your knee that's found here at, at the knee joint? Yep, the patella. Yep. Right, good for Halloween. Yeah, so so buy yourself a skeleton and then you got something to decorate for Halloween. Absolutely. Yep. So when we're talking about the knee joint, we're going to have some bone markings that are on the femur. We're going to have some bone markings that are on tibia. We will also have um, the patella would be included in that as well. The patella doesn't have to know. Um, we just want to be able to identify that that uh, bone there. Let me see. Nicole asked if these answers will be listed for you in the packet. They are not listed for you. We're, we're being mean. We're making you um, come up with a list on your own. But there are a lot of great pictures in the supplemental resources. Uh, actually, I apologize, in the labeled images PowerPoint that show you these particular joints. So um, chat with neighbors in your class group me uh, about that if you want to compare answers. But really, the best way to study this is either to and review the structures there or find yourself a picture of the bones see if you can name those bone markings there that's the goal with this activity can I can I name the bone markings I see there any other questions about joints joint names these markings that kind of stuff I do really think with with the joints that this is going to be something you can uh, think your way through. I, I am a strong advocate of anything that you have to memorize, memorize that. Anything you don't have to memorize that you could think your way through, practice thinking your way through because there's just too much for you to have to memorize. This is not something you have to memorize. You can think your way through this. All right. Well, I have no more questions coming in about that right now. So I want to work with you guys then. We'll do another example of that last activity in your lab packet, the origin, insertion, action activity. If you want some help with labeling muscles, we did that in yesterday's office hours. So please check out that video from yesterday's office hours. We also talked a lot about these activities with movements. So please do take the time to go through and look at that portion of the office hours from yesterday. What we're going to spend our time doing here, um, yesterday we worked together to map out the uh, adductor group that you see over here on the left. So just to mix things up, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the next page in your lab packet 
and we're going to work together on rectus femoris. We're going to do, do the rectus femoris activity together. Yeah, Pilar's excited about, about doing this. So we're going to do rectus femoris together. Um, you're going to see a lot of these types of activities in the lab packet going forward because on the exam, we're going to ask you to make some predictions about muscle actions. And these kinds of activities are going to help you prepare to make those predictions. So we're going to work together on this um, to, to help us practice making predictions. When you do this, you do not have to have three different colored pencils. Um, I would recommend it if you if you happen to have three colored pencils or crayons or markers sitting around your house, go for it. I'm going to use the colors that are listed here in the packet just so that it will help us with visualizing things. Um, so they say that we should label the origins of our muscles in blue. So when I start trying to draw my muscles, I'm going to make the origins blue and I'm going to make the insertion green like they talk about green for those insertions. We talked about this terminology yesterday, but let me give us a review here. And my friends from uh, from our, our session yesterday can help me out with this too. When I talk about the origin of a muscle, what did we say happens at the origin of a muscle when that muscle contracts? What happens at the origin when a muscle contracts? Anybody remember? Nicole's got a vote. Yep. Yeah, no movement. Absolutely. Okay. Origin. No movement. When a muscle contracts, I need a place that that muscle attaches to that does not move. Otherwise, it'd be real funky for me to try to do muscle movements. So the origin is a place that a muscle attaches to. There is no movement. So the insertion is the other place that my muscles attach. If the origin doesn't move, the insertion does move. The, the insertion is the place where a muscle attaches to that does move. The origin is a place where it attaches that it does not move. What we're doing with this activity here is we are looking at places where a muscle attaches that it's not moving, and we're looking at the places that it attaches where it does move. When a muscle moves, the insertions toward the origin. Here, I'll point this out right here. You've got this in uh, on the page in your notes. Underline, highlight, star. It, it's there on your page, probably at the bottom of the page. When a muscle contracts, the insertion always moves toward the origin. In other words, if you know the two places a muscle attaches to, and I tell you which one is the insertion, which one is the moving one, and I tell you which one is the origin, the one that's not the moving one, you can predict the way that muscle is going to move. So let's label some specific ones here, and then we'll, we'll go through and make some predictions there. When I talk about rectus femoris, I am talking about a muscle that lives on the front side of the thigh. I'll draw for us a version of it, and then we'll go and we're gonna, gonna label our structures um, together. So rectus femoris, the way you usually see it, we're, we're gonna see it along the front part of the thigh. Let me see, yeah, it's attaching down here. Rectus femoris is the big one in the middle on the front of your thigh. So as a heads up, here's where rectus femoris is generally found. Now we're gonna look at its specific bone marking attachments to, to help us. We're gonna start with the origins. We're gonna start with the ones that don't move. When I talk about rectus femoris, there are two places that it attaches to. It attaches to the ilium bone and it attaches to the acetabulum. Um, the acetabulum is the big indentation that I find at the hip joint. So the acetabulum is up kind of inside here next to where we see the, the femur going in. The ilium bone is the one that you rest your hands on when you um, put your hands on your hips. So my attachment sites are kind of up here on the ilium bone and the acetabulum. This is my origin up here. Now I'm going to switch colors for my insertion. My insertion is I attach to the patella and I attach to something called the tibial tuberosity. So we already found our patella, right? That's our kneecap. We talked about the kneecap. The tibial tuberosity 
um, using one of those bone marking words that, that we learned before uh, we took the midterm exam. When I talk about curiosity, my friends from yesterday can help us out with this. A tuberosity, is that something like a hole? Is that a projection? Is that an indentation? This word tuberosity, which of those groups did a tuberosity fall into? Tuberosity. Yeah, there we go. We're getting some votes. So when I talk about a tuberosity, I was talking about something in a group that, that sticks up. So it's a projection, it's a line. Um, really, this word tuberosity kind of means a bump. Um, so when you're looking at, let's see if I can get my skeleton friend here. I ran up to school, by the way, to save one of these guys so he didn't have to live inside the lab all by himself. I'm looking at the tibia here. I know it's a little but on the front side of the tibia, sticking out a little bit, this bump right here, this is my tibial tuberosity. A tuberosity is a projection or something that sticks out. If you're having trouble remembering that, no shame in that. Just go back to week six. Go back to that packet and see where we sorted things. So the tibial tuberosity is the big bump on the front side of the tibia. That's about right here on my tibia. So my tibial tuberosity and I've got my, my patella right here. These are my two insertions. Up here at the top, I have my origin. Help me out here. When I talk about the stuff at the top and the stuff down here at the bottom, which of these is actually going to move? Is it gonna be the top or the bottom? Based on what they are, the origins versus the insertion, which end of this muscle is gonna move? The top or the bottom? Absolutely. I got some votes coming in. It's going to be the bottom part of this muscle that actually moves. But these down here are my insertions. So now that I have mapped out my origin over here, I've mapped out my insertions down here. We get to do a little bit of connect the dots here. So let me get my red for my muscle. I'm going to connect my origin to my insertions here. I know it's real ugly. We're going to connect the origins to the insertions. Okay, so how does this help me? This helps me to know that down here at the bottom where I attach, when rectus femoris, the big muscle on the front side of my thigh, when this muscle contracts, the bottom part down here, the part where it attaches that is my insertions, this is going to move toward the origin. Now, what I want you guys to do, because this would be the way we, we try to do this in class, I want you to put one hand up kind of on your hip joint, up by where this origin would be, and I want you to put one hand down kind of on your kneecap or on your tibia. When, I am, um, when I'm working on making my my uh, kneecap and, and the first part of my tibia here, when I want to bring the tibia closer to the hip, I'm pulling on the tibia. I'm pulling it closer to the hip joint. So we're probably all, we're either sitting or laying in bed, right? So um, if you put your leg at a 90 degree angle, so it's hanging down kind of like this. When my leg is hanging down, here's my, well, here we got our cells in front here. I got my leg. Let's see if he can, can hold on to me here. We're going to cuddle with the skeleton. PDA, sorry. Okay. When I got my leg like this, I have an attachment right down here on the tibial tuberosity. I'm going to bring this attachment on the tibial tuberosity closer to my hip joint here. When I pull on this and pull it closer to the hip joint, it's not going to come a lot closer, but it's going to go like this. And feel that on you. When your, your tibial tuberosity is pointed down, it's farther away from, from your hip than when I point it out like this. I have taken my tibia from this, this angle right here. I've straightened it out. That movement, do we, let's see if any friends remember from yesterday. When I take the tibia from hanging down 
to kicking it straight out. Would we call this flexion or extension? What's this movement right here? Putting your legs straight out, would that be flexion or extension? Yeah, we're chiming in here. When I go from a 90 degree angle to 180 degrees, when I straighten it out, to bring this tibial tuberosity closer to my hip joint up here, what I'm doing is called extension. So my technical anatomy word for what rectus femoris does is it extends the tibia at the knee. It extends the tibia at the knee. But if you look down at your two options, our predictions here, we don't have a place that my predictions say extension. And that's on purpose. We're, we're making you think a little bit. We're wanting you to give us a definition, or we're wanting to know which of these two descriptions means extension. Extension. So extension and flexion, those guys were opposites of each other. When we're talking about what it does to my angle at a joint, extension, does that make the angle uh, bigger or does that make the angle smaller at a joint? Anybody remember? Extension does what to that angle? Does it get bigger or does it get smaller? Yeah, a couple of us are voting in. It does get bigger. The angle gets bigger. The angle increases. Remember the, the best way to help you remember flexion and extension is if you've got your arm in front of you. I'm all the way extended out, and then I flex my arm like I'm doing a bicep curl. The angle at my elbow joint just got smaller. Flexion is when the angle gets smaller. The bones move closer together. Extension is when they move apart. So we talked about what's happening at the knee joint, particular muscle. At the knee joint, I'm attached to my tibial tuberosity down here. I'm pulling that tibial tuberosity toward the acetabulum. Because I'm pulling it toward the acetabulum, that makes my lower leg go completely straight. That's doing extension. So that's increasing the angle that, that I see at that joint. Uh, Bella chimed in as well. We talked about this yesterday, um, specifically what this prediction question asked was what we're doing with the tibia with rectus femoris. However, rectus femoris can also move the femur, the bone that's hiding under it. Rectus femoris can also move that femur. Uh, so when rectus femoris moves the femur, it's actually going to pull the femur um, closer to the hip joint. So uh, Bella's absolutely right. The, if, if my question didn't ask you about what's happening at the knee joint, if my question instead, let me type for you, says increases angle at hip joint or decreases angle at hip joint, we we're talking about the hip, not the knee. We actually say the opposite. This would be a muscle that does flexion at the hip joint. Yeah, so it flexes the femur at, at the hip joint. And I know for some of you, I just blew your mind. Um, this is when I'm going to refer you to the recording from yesterday's office hours because we talked a lot about this. Muscles that live on the front side of your thigh or live on, on the front side on top of your femur, they're gonna flex the femur, pull the femur up, um, but at the same time, they're also gonna do what we call extension on the tibia, which is what we saw with the skeleton, where it extends it out, makes it go flat. So please check out the office hours from yesterday. We talked about that, uh, front side versus back side, femur, tibia, all that kind of stuff. On this activity, any other last minute questions, origins and insertions to predict their actions? Or if you're feeling as okay as you can right now, can you give me a thumbs up? If you're feeling okay, give me a thumbs up or um, please feel free to, to give me a question and I'd be happy to, to address that. We got 
plenty of time to talk about action potential, by the way. So we're, we'll definitely talk about action potential. Okay. I've got several thumbs up, so I'm going to go ahead and, and move back to action potential. What I will tell you guys is if you think of questions over the next couple of days related to this stuff, please feel free to email me. Um, do you give me a 24 hour window to, to respond? Um, we were talking earlier before a lot of you guys came in this morning. Um, one of our classmates is working in the ICU. So, so far so good in the ICU, she was saying. Um, but in, in medical facilities around the state, pretty much have to start triaging where you kind of decide what's most important and what's less important. So in the triage process, your email might not get responded to right away but I will try to get a response to you within 24 hours. So give me a little bit of grace and a little bit of time on that. I will will try to answer questions as, as much as I can. All right, let's do actual. So this is back to lecture number nine. Uh, we're gonna go back to lecture number line, nine, our last topic here for today. Somebody help me out. We're in the lecture number nine packet. Can you guys tell me what page we're on in the lecture number nine packet with our picture here about an action potential? What page is the action potential on? Okay, I'm here on page number seven. Okay, so this is page number seven of, of your lecture outline here. We're gonna talk about the action potential. Before we talk about specifically what this picture shows, we should write a definition for ourselves the definition we need to write for ourselves of what is what an action potential actually is. Um, so we did talk about this in um, in office hours earlier this week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two ways to describe it. One way that Bella just mentioned for us, um, that's a great way to think about it, is think about it kind of as a chain reaction. Chain reaction. So in other words, yeah, like Irini is mentioning for us, we, we change our membrane charge, and then that's going to trigger a chain reaction where we change the membrane charge other places. Um, the way that I believe I def we defined it in our lecture outline technically is that an action potential is um, a change in membrane charge, and here's our underlined highlight star that moves. It starts in one place and it moves to other places. An action potential is a change in membrane charge that moves. Or um, like, like we were discussing in office hours, um, it, it is really a chain reaction. If one part of, of your membrane changes its charge, its neighboring parts will change their charge, which will cause the neighboring parts to change their charge. So it's, it really is a chain reaction where we change those membrane charges. So when we talk about action potentials, we are changing the membrane charge. Our goal is to get every single place in my muscle cell to change its membrane charge around the same time. Because when I change my membrane charge, that's going to allow me to spit out the calcium I need for muscle contraction to happen. So, um, we, we talked about today, we looked at our picture today of that place called the neuromuscular junction, right? The neuromuscular junction being the place where a neuron spits out acetylcholine and that is used to make the muscle cell contract. I do not want it to just be my neuromuscular junction, just the place where a neuron meets a muscle cell that's not the only place that I need to contract in the process of muscle contraction. Everybody's got to contract. So uh, I use an action potential to get that change in membrane charge from the neuromuscular junction where it started all the way through my entire muscle cell. For friends who have come to other office hours, see if you can help me out with this question here. What is the name of the structures that I have inside a muscle cell or a muscle fiber that allow me to take my membrane charge from the neuromuscular junction to everywhere else in my cell. It's a place where I, yeah, where I folded in my plasma membrane. I, I got some, some votes coming in here, absolutely. Um, the, the T tubules, and we talked about those in lab, 
before spring break. The T tubules are places where I folded in the membrane. I folded in the sarcolemma. The goal of folding in the sarcolemma or the membrane charge is to give me a pathway to send these action potentials everywhere. So a signal starts at the neuromuscular junction. That signal travels through the T tubules. The way that it travels through the T tubules is using this action potential. So that's what I see right here. So when I talk about an action potential, I am talking about a charge that's going to move. The way that this charge moves is because of the special type of ion channels that I find inside my uh, the type of ion channels that I find in the T tubules, they are called voltage gated sodium channels. Voltage gated sodium channels. Let's do my favorite question. We are gated. Gated means always or not always open. Gated channels. Always or not always open. Not always. Absolutely. Yep, we're all chiming in. Gated is not always open. Okay, so these channels that live inside the T2 are not always open. They're not always sending a message. They are voltage gated. So what's going to open up my gate? A voltage gated channel. What opens up those gates? What does that voltage part mean? means. Anyone remember? Yeah, it's all about charge. Okay, it's all about charge. So I use voltage gated sodium channels to get a charge to travel across the membrane. The way that this works right here at the beginning, the first part of my picture, I see a place on my membrane, maybe it's the beginning of my T tubule, where I have a bunch of sodium that's rushing inside my membrane. Remember that muscle cells normally have a negative charge on the inside. They're normally negative 90 on the inside. They're even more negative than, than a neuron is. So normally we're negative 90 here in the uh, uh, normally. But what happened here at the beginning of my picture is a bunch of sodium has rushed inside. Um, this sodium is a, it's a cation, so it's bringing positive charges with it that I see right here. When these positive charges come in, to this part of my, my T tubule, those positive charges make this part of the T tubule get more positive just by the fact that they're, they're next door. I've got a bunch of positivity right here. This part of the membrane says, oh my gosh, we're going positive. It opens up its voltage gated sodium channels. So now I see in my picture right here, notice that the sodium is rushing inside right here because I had a bunch of positive charges that were, were over here that opened up the voltage gated channels next door. So now they're pumping in a whole bunch of sodium because their voltage gated channels got open. Well, I put a whole bunch of sodium right here and that's gonna make this part of the membrane go positive as well. So now I see uh, in the next frame, this part of my membrane go positive because my voltage gated sodium channels here open up as well. This, proce uh, this process is going to continue all the way down the T-tubule. Let me bounce pictures here. So it starts up here in the top of the T-tubule. Then these voltage-gated sodium channels get opened up. Then these voltage-gated sodium channels get opened up. We go all the way down this T-tubule and open up our voltage-gated sodium channels everywhere. The reason that's important for me is because that's going to take that positive charge all the way throughout the cell because when that positive charge gets all the way throughout the cell when it gets down to these voltage gated sodium channels that I see right here these ones down here inside the T tubules they are connected to something that are called mechanically gated calcium channels mechanically gated calcium channels I'll remind you because it's a, it's a little bit weird here. Uh, mechanically gated means that I push on it to open it. When my voltage gated sodium 
T-tubules start freaking out when they change their, their shape and they open up to let sodium in. They also end up bumping into, they call them calcium release channels right here. These are little channels that are, are basically attached to the voltage gated sodium channels. So they get pushed open and out spits that calcium. If you need a reminder of why calcium is important for the process of muscle contraction, remember when we were talking about those regulatory proteins? Uh, with the regulatory proteins, I used calcium to change the shape of the push pin. When the push pin changed its shape, that was the spaghetti noodle, and now myosin and actin can happen. Uh, they can, can interact with each other. So I've got to spit out my calcium to be able to start the entire process of contraction. And this slide right here, you've got this series of pictures in your notes. This would be an underlined highlight star um, group of pictures. I, I told you guys when we were in class together that one of the things I recommended you do is you stand in a mirror and you talk through these processes of, uh, of things that we're talking about. This picture shows you from when my motor neuron spits out its message to when that message or that action potential travels down the T-tubules to when I do the cross bridge cycle. This is how muscle contraction works. So try to explain to your neighbors, try to write down for yourself. When we start here with, with a neuron spitting out its neurotransmitters, all the way down to the point where uh, we're talking about the cross bridge cycle, we want to understand the steps from beginning to end. And I know there's an activity in the lesson for you that helps you to put those steps in order. I know we've got some videos uh, that help with that as well. So big picture, this, this is where we're going. This is what we want um, to make sure we can understand from beginning to end, how does muscle contraction work? Let me open the floor for questions. What questions do we still have? Questions maybe still forthcoming here. Let me pop up this slide for you guys as we're closing out. I know. Yeah, I wish we still had a class. I, I agree. I would much rather be with you guys than, than separated. Much rather that than the social distancing. Well, let's chat through this, this really fast here. Um, today is Friday, in case uh, you were having trouble keeping track. Oh, I am mixing my days up. Today is Friday. So two days from now is Sunday. There are two things due on Sunday. First thing due on Sunday is the week 11 lab homework. Hey, um, I have an announcement about this that I need you guys to put out and group me for me. Um, I chatted with some of the other anatomy faculty. We are changing the homework assignments to have unlimited attempts. So please let your classmates know and group me. Um, I, after we finish our, our session here together, I'm going to switch over your lab homework assignment for week 11 to have unlimited attempts. So if you've exhausted all three of your attempts, you didn't get 100%, um, I'm going to open it back up for you. So um, first thing I need you to let your friends know in group me, um, the homework, it's due on Sunday. You are going to have unlimited attempts on that one. Um, so that's the lab homework. We already had unlimited attempts on the lecture homework. Um, please take advantage of those. Keep working on them. Both the lecture and the lab assignment, regardless of when you used to have lab with me, both of them are due Sunday by 11.59. What we told ourselves when we were we were meeting in class together, instead of being 11, uh, 11.59, tell yourself it's 11.45. Because that gives you 15 minutes of wiggle room to make sure we get it submitted. So unlimited attempts on the lab and the lecture homework, both of them due Sunday night. Not already looked into the area of the Blackboard site that talks about um, the the group activities. Um, hopefully, you had a chance to look over the recording of our office hours about going online. We are not doing anatomy for babies anymore because logistically, that's just too hard. 
What we're going to do instead is we're going to work with our neighbors to build some study guides for the upcoming exams to try to help us prepare together and collaborate together. So before I start asking you to do like actual content assignments um, with building those study guides, I've built for you guys a really simple um, uh, assignment that you're going to do with, with a group of classmates. Basically, I'm asking you what's going on in your life now that we're online. So how has coronavirus changed things for you? That kind of stuff. It's um, There's no right or wrong answer. That's basically what I'm trying to say here. So um, by Wednesday at, at 59 p.m., you and your group need to have um, had each member answer the questions that are posted there. There's just two questions. Um, so you will access this here. Let me Let me share that screen for you. Bear with me. We're going to pull up right here. Okay. I'm in my course Blackboard site. Notice here, I'll make it a little bit bigger. It's a little small. Over here on the left side, online groups for group work assignments. Um, it's not going to show me what you see when you get there, but when you click on um, this, this area, online groups for group work assignments, it will show you that you are in a group um, for, let me see what I specifically called it, um, adjusting to online assignments. So it's going to say adjusting to online assignments one, two, five, whatever, when you click on here. Um, the place that you're going to input your answers to that assignment is called the wiki. So I've created a wiki page for you and your group that has the questions in there. So just go through and put in your answers to the question. You'll see that there are answers from your other group members in there. Uh, that assignment or that wiki is due April 1st. Um, so that is, is the first group work activity that we're going to do in there. Um, please be working on that. There is a way for you to email your group members from inside this screen as well. Again, I apologize, it won't show me since I'm not actually a student in a group. Um, but it will give you an option to send an email to your, your group mates. So if somebody hasn't contributed and we're starting to get really close to that deadline, go ahead and shoot out an email. It'll send the email out to everyone just to make sure we're all on the same page getting that done. So that is due um, Wednesday night, April 1st by mid. Let me pull back up my PowerPoint. So. Um, that's right there, the assigned group assignment, the, the wikis right there. Um, I will also get posted for you on, um, on th this weekend. I am going to work on starting to build you the, the groups for unit three, your unit three study guide that you're going to build. So I hope to have those built um, by the end of the weekend. I'm going to put that on my to-do list. Groups for unit three. Um, I say building the groups, but actually the computer randomly assigns them. I'm sorry, I can't group you with particular people. Please um, keep studying with your friends. I know. Um, please keep studying with the friends that you had in, had had relationships with in class. Um, but just to make sure that everyone's in a group, we're all contributing. It's just gonna gonna mix you up. So um, I'm gonna try to get that posted for you by the end of the weekend, so you have that available. The other thing I'll mention is. Um, if at all possible, we really, really should start working on lesson number 10 as soon as possible. Um, lesson number 10 is about the way that neurons work. And next week when I start doing office hours, it's going to be really important that we come to office hours having done at least. Uh, we got to work on some of this stuff ahead of time, because if you don't, you're going to be really lost. Um, let me show you. Um, here we go. For this week, I put out for you guys what the schedule was, and I told you what we'd be doing each day. I am going to get a new schedule posted for, for next week as well with what we're going to be doing. We will probably take um, three days specifically devoted to um, the beginning, middle, and end of lesson number 10. Uh, you do need to give yourself plenty of time to work through that lesson, though. So um, it, it's a lot of processes. It's a lot of understanding the pieces that go together. So please be watching for this. It'll be the hour schedule, and it'll tell you exactly what we're going to be talking about that day. 
and it'll give you a list of which pages in, in that lesson for you to be completing or um, which activities that you should have done. You will notice on lesson number 10 that there is a new outline posted for you. I would recommend going ahead and printing that new outline. You don't have to. If you already printed the, the lecture number 10 outline before break, you can um, do kind of like lecture number nine, where we kind of piecemealed it back and forth. But if you want something that really matches your online lesson, go ahead and print that new one. It's attached to the lesson for you. Um, so, so that is there, there for you, um, lesson number 10. Please try to get that started as soon as possible. Let me go back to my questions. Um, Pilar, I'll get your content question here in a minute, so remind me in case I forget. Uh, any idea on anatomy for babies? No, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I don't know when that's gonna get graded. Um, it's going to get graded, and it's gonna get graded in enough time for you to make revisions as needed. Um, but my focus right now is to make sure you guys have the content that you need. So I do not know when that will get graded, but I do promise it will get graded. Um, are we able to edit what we put in? Absolutely, on the, on, the, on the group wikis. Yes, you can definitely edit what you put in. So if you want to add something, if you want to take something out, that's totally fine. Um, when we start doing content work as well, too, if um, you had a neighbor that was assigned to one of the questions in your group, and you feel like there's some extra information that you want to add to that, or if you want to correct something, maybe there was a, a, a typo or some kind of spelling error, um, yes, you can definitely edit the stuff that's in the wiki. Uh, that is editable. Do we need to start working on the brain and the bones and the muscles of the head? Um, that is next week's lab. So yes, once you have wrapped up um, the week 11 lab packet, go ahead and start working on week 12 as well. Um, I think that next week, the day that we will do either going to be Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so we definitely want to start working on that by whatever day we're doing that in virtual office hours next week. So that's the next packet. When you're, you're done with all the stuff for week 11, yes, go ahead and move on, on to week 12. Any other general, um, the way we're running our course questions? So due dates, questions of when we should be working on things, that kind of stuff. Any more of those kind of questions? before I go back to Pilar's question. Okay, well, let me go back to that question really fast. Pilar asks, so an action potential is necessary for muscle contraction because we need a charge to initiate the process. Absolutely correct, yes. Um, we call the process of muscle contraction, and we talked about this a bunch on Tuesday. We call it excitation, contraction, coupling. For us to be able to do the contraction part of its name, which is the muscle contraction, I need to have a signal. And so we said the excitation part of its name is that I need a signal to do something, and that signal is an action potential. So yes, I need an action potential for muscle contraction to happen. If I don't have potential, there will be no muscle contraction. That is correct. All right, any other last minute questions that you guys have for me while we're all here together? Any last minute questions? You're welcome, glad to, glad to be able to, to help you guys out. I'll put those due dates back up. I know that it's, it's a crazy transition I appreciate you guys being patient with me and I will do what I can to, to be patient with and, and to help you guys too. Again, please make sure that it gets out in your class group me's that the homework assignments are going to switch to unlimited attempts. Um, again, I'll take care of that today. So by tonight, you should see that it's switched over to you have unlimited attempts on that homework assignment for week 11. And you already got that on week nine. So please stay on top of those due dates uh, to, to keep working on things. All right, well, that's all I got for the day. In case any of us came in a little bit late, here I'll pop up our joke for you. 
it, it's getting a little harder to be honest with you guys it's getting a little harder to find jokes because I already I already put some of the good ones up there so here's my joke for the day it's not great but it'll do the job so um, as you go out into your weekend good luck with with your studying with working on stuff um, feel free to email me I'll get back in touch with you as soon as I can but I will see you again on Monday. It'll be 9.30 to 11.30, just, just like we did this week, every day of the week. Um, we will we'll be working our way through stuff together. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the recording, and then I'll stay here in, in the room to, to chat with anyone with other questions.